For many years, if one thing defined Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear games, it might have been their epic boss fights. In this video essay, we'll discuss in broad terms how Kojima developed his signature boss design style while taking a brief look at some of the better examples of Kojima's style throughout his career. With that, let's get started. From the very start, Kojima's bosses dripped with anime and manga tropes as unique cross-medium hybrids. But even on the MSX2 platform where Kojima got his start, this designer was trying to find ways of making the traditional boss battle more open-ended. Most of the bosses on Metal Gear 87 resemble the Zelda format, where each one requires a specific weapon to defeat. As a platform for gaming, the MSX severely limited Metal Gear from easily competing with other world-class action titles. To get relatively on par with such rivals, Kojima had to invent the tactical espionage genre, formally codified by that name as of 1990's Metal Gear 2. This hybrid genre combined aspects from RPGs and sim games in addition to your typical military action planting seeds for what today we call the survival and stealth genres. Boss fights were certainly part of all of this. The MSX era for the series also had its roots in an arcade-adjacent genre called the maze-type game. As the name suggests, maze games are difficult to navigate and hard to survive. The first two Metal Gears followed this tradition, except they combined the maze genre with many aspects from other innovative influences on Kojima from the investigatory, story-heavy drama of Yuji Horii's Portopia serial murders, to the proto-open-world, non-linear structure, and the many bosses, of course, found in Nintendo's classic The Legend of Zelda. It has always truly been Kojima's talent to fuse disparate elements and influences together and synthesize from them something decidedly new. A major example, clear even early on, had to be how Kojima imported into Metal Gear the basic language or framework of film, always carefully thinking the player's emotional or mental journey through in advance as much as possible. This led to creative and dramatic boss scenarios. Suddenly, Snake found himself face to face with a giant bulldozer, for example, or having to carefully pick and choose our shots lest we harm one of the terrorists' hostages. But the almost open world Zelda-esque elements were clear from finding also during one of those enemy ambushes that you're prone in Metal Gear to walk right into, that you currently lacked the right weapon to challenge your foe at that time. You'd have to double back, find the right weapon, and then return. The MSX era saw a ton of backtracking, as was more the norm in the late 80s and early 90s. Bosses were already well utilized as a welcome way to break up some of that maze maneuvering and stealth.
But as the MSX era begat that of the PS1, Kojima would really come into his own in a world-changing way once he'd get his hands on real-time 3D. It was with Metal Gear Solid in 1998 that this series first arguably emerged as truly one of the all-time greats for bosses generally, from the characters to the battle designs. The first 3D Metal Gear on the PS1 was created, in the same tradition as the earlier titles on the MSX, to emphasize humanist themes, and in particular, to humanize the enemy. Confrontations with the enemy are always meant in a stealth game like Metal Gear to be avoided, right? While the bosses have always worked as a kind of break from sneaking, like I said. But in MGS1, more often than not, boss fights became confrontations of a different sort. Ultimately, MGS1's bosses each served to reflect a separate aspect of our player character. Snake, how oh, do you like me? What the? Do you like me? Hold me, Snake. What's wrong? Snake, Meryl's not herself. In them, more than against them, we come face to face with ourselves. MGS1 gave us a cast of boss characters that were nothing short of unforgettable, from the psychic Psychomantis to the beautiful and deadly sharpshooter Sniper Wolf to the towering shaman Vulcan Raven. This was boss writing and boss scenario design on a level that the industry frankly had never seen. Metal Gear Solid 2, meanwhile, which followed Metal Gear Solid 1 by 2001, took things even further, giving us bosses that really strained our suspension of disbelief in the best ways possible. Taking on a Harrier Jet, a vampire who comes back from the dead and can walk on water, a beautiful blonde witch that bullets can never hit, and a rotund, egg-headed man with his perfectly manicured fingers, Metal Gear Solid 2 was a smorgasbord of weirdos. And the weirdness, not only to the bosses, but to the entire game, went a long way in making it a true classic. With Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, boss battles became more like miniature toy sets with a more satisfying variety of possible solutions or tactics to choose from at any given time. Since the original Metal Gears on the MSX, bosses have served important storytelling functions. Given how most of the original dialogue that had been written for Metal Gear 87, for example, had to be, for various reasons, scrapped or altered, apart from the main premise, bosses in Metal Gear 87 were really some of your only chances to directly come into contact with this unique game world. I don't just mean that bosses are the only time your adversaries are given a recognizable face. How they're designed, even back on the MSX, it already demonstrates Kojima's acute awareness of what things can only work and work best as video games. At this stage in the medium, the late 80s to early 90s, it's really all about motive. The devs have gotten us to play their game, okay, how do they get us to feel things about it? Bosses, as so-called bad guys, or simply antagonists, can stir up powerful responses. Why? Because unlike in any other medium, in video games, our player characters fight against all enemies isn't some second-hand thing. There's no thinking, it's purely metaphor. No, we literally fight our enemies in games like Metal Gear. It's this participation, this back and forth. Really the same one that's at the heart of kids' games like hide-and-seek that makes Kojima's tactical espionage genre so uniquely well-suited for video games. Take for example an early boss, Shotmaker, from Metal Gear. Snake has to let the enemy capture him to make contact with the missing fellow Foxhound operative, Gray Fox. It's on your way out of the prison, as good as naked, that Snake gets ambushed for real, this time by Shotmaker. In a classic example of early Metal Gear's maze-like design, first you had to figure out where your gear's being hidden, and then how to free it before you could even consider taking on Shotmaker directly. 
The actual combat for Metal Gear on the MSX is of course uninspired compared to what bigger platforms of the era could do. But these almost adventure game, sim, and RPG elements that could be found to a small extent in Metal Gear 1 and to a much larger extent in the follow-up Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake all compensated greatly for these games' relative lack of platform prowess with a surplus of ingenious creativity. As much as it could, MGS1 added light non-linearity to boss fights, insofar as now almost never were players required only to tackle a fight one way. This corresponded with a larger shift in the medium as a whole, as the cryptic design idea meant to delay the inevitable solution by the player proved to be a lot less fun for the player on subsequent playthroughs once solved. That was pretty different to boss designs and puzzle designs that could find ways to still remain a challenge even once you had figured out the secret trick to them. But really, the defining contribution at the time by MGS1's bosses was that they didn't die, not right away anyway. And in something by that point having become a tradition, the final boss of the game was actually someone who had been very close to you all along. Metal Gear Solid 2 introduced greater sophistication when it came to differences among difficulties. At the more suicidal end of the spectrum, we have the infamous European Extreme, where even a strong gust of wind might give Snake herpes. In all seriousness, European Extreme difficulty was more or less always a case of do or die. There are no rations, and almost every boss kills you with one-shots. You have to be pretty much perfect across each entire boss battle while avoiding the enemy entirely in between. And this is also the difficulty, by the way, where all the bosses are at their most aggressive. According to Metal Gear Speedrunners, as just a few random examples, you can't use auto-aim against Olga on the extremes. Fortune fires two shots at a time instead of one. Fat Man's more aggressive when he rushes you during bomb disposal. The Harriers cluster bombs always leave the player at one HP and on fire, and so on. But Snake Eater in 2004 obviously perfected the boss battle as a concept, so much so I'd argue that we've never yet really seen its Cobra unit topped. These were truly open-ended playgrounds which well suited the consequent gameplay changes and shifts in style, era, and tone. MGS4 hid everything its bosses could do so that most players wouldn't even see them only for Peace Walker in 2010 to arguably make boss fights too much like the other PSP hit Monster Hunter to ensure the same near constant level of quality that had been found in the earlier Metal Gear Solid games. Even if the bosses in Peace Walker were still rather fun, despite being grindy and bullet spongy. And last but not least, with Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, things went full circle, reintroducing a similar feeling of non-linearity that the MSX Metal Gears could only half suggest. Doing so by re-implementing certain arcade elements, and most of all featuring, like on the MSX, bosses that you didn't have to fight right away, that maybe you'd encounter, back off from, and come back later when you had a stronger weapon to face. Well, there you have it. Metal Gear will always be remembered by fans over the world for boss characters, scenarios, and battles that we will never forget. So here's to Metal Gear, the series with the greatest boss fights in history. Until next time, boss.